So Mark Taylor is going to tell us about um, the product that most of you probably have seen, Topcat. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking not exactly about Topcat, but about uh, using some of the libraries that it uses for visualization for uh, in browser visualization. Uh, for those of you who haven't come across it, Topcat is a desktop Java GUI application which works with tabular data, that typically means source catalogs, can be other things. Uh, and it does various things that you need to do with tables, so things like cross-matching and row selections and column manipulations and uh, talking to external services and so on. But its basic mission is to do all the boring mechanical things that astronomers need to do with tables so that the astronomers can concentrate on astronomy rather than on moving numbers from one place to another. It comes with uh, an associated package called stilts, which does all the same things from a uh, command line context. And in fact, what I'm talking about today has really got more to do with stilts than with Topcat, um, but they rely on the same libraries and, and Topcat has a bit more brand recognition as I used that in the title. So one of the things it does is visualization. Um, obviously there's a lot of different visualization packages out there. Why would you want to use Topcat? Um, well, it's quite scalable. It works well with uh, large numbers of points, so certainly uh, multi-million row tables, uh, and you don't need to make any particular preparation of the data for it to do the visualizations. Um, and you don't need to have a high specification machine for that. That will work on any old laptop or desktop, but if you feed it more memory and more cores, then it will run faster and you can work with larger data sets. It's quite flexible, there's lots of different plot types and all of those plot types come with lots of different configuration options, so marker sizes and color maps and line thicknesses and so on. And the plots are, are very interactive, so you can do all the kinds of navigation in 2D and 3D that you'd expect to be able to. Um, and it tries hard to make sense for both uh, if you've got millions and millions of points or if you've just got a few. So here is some kind of uh, plottable sky data and you can see the large scale structure, the data, data, darker parts are where there are more points plotted on top of each other. But you can uh, zoom in all the way. Uh, and so you can see the individual aspects of the data if you're interested in a, in a single point, uh, just as well as the large scale structure and it, it transitions smoothly between them. There's various other uh, things that it does in visualization, but I won't go through those now because that's not so relevant to uh, what I'm talking about today. Uh, and again, I won't go through all the different kinds of plots that it can do, but that's uh, just an image which gives you a flavor of some of the kinds of things. Uh, so I've been bashing away at Topcat for several years now, and one of the questions that I hear quite often is, can I run it in a browser? To which the answer is basically no. Um, web applications are great. Uh, I don't need to tell you that. There have been plenty of talks at this conference which have shown uh, some amazing stuff happening in browsers. Um, but I don't plan to move Topcat wholesale into a browser um, for various reasons. One thing is GUI considerations. Um, I don't think that trying to kind of fit all the controls into one browser window is really feasible from a usability point of view. There are also issues to do with the way it does memory management, um, especially for data sets that are larger than local memory. It uses disk mapping, which wouldn't work well from within the browser sandbox. But there are some aspects of what Topcat does that I think do make sense in a browser, and interactive visualization is one of those. So uh, I've tried to explore that. What I'm talking about with right visualization here is a uh, visualization of, of tabular data. So that effectively means things like scatter plots, which extends to things like histograms and, and 3D scatter plots as well, but not, I'm not talking about um, all sky visualization or visualization of gridded data. Um, and so what I mean is if you've got uh, a scatter plot, if, if you've got a browser and you want to be able to display a plot, in the browser, but your data is not locally to that machine. The data is uh, on some server somewhere remotely from where the browser is. Um, and so there are essentially two approaches you can uh, apply to that, two ways you can do it. One is you have a smart client. And so the client uh, asks the service, can you please send me the data set? And then the client does all the rendering of the plotting and interacts with the user um, and does zooming and, and panning and so on. And that works pretty well. Uh, there's quite a number of JavaScript libraries around there that do that, um, as long as the data set is not too large. If you have a very large data set, um, then you run into two problems. One is it takes a long time to download from the server into the browser, and the other is it can uh, exhaust resources in the browser. It runs out of memory uh, and the whole thing falls over. 
So the alternative is a dumb client, um, which tells the server what plot it wants to make, and then the server sends an image back uh, and the browser displays the image. Of course, when the user interacts with it, um, it has to ask the server for another image. Uh, and so the interaction tends to be less smooth, it's a bit more clunky, uh, but it's not vulnerable to the same scalability issues. It will work even if you have a very, very large data set on the server, as long as the server is capable of rendering that. And so that's the uh, approach that I've pursued here. Um, on the original version of this slide, I wrote for a few hundred thousand points or more, you, you're forced to use this dumb client uh, approach. Having seen Mathieu's talk on, I think, Monday about Aladdin Light, uh, all right, he's working with a few million points in the browser because he's a smart guy. Um, but eventually, if you have uh, a, a very large number of points, uh, the, the smart client um, approach runs out of steam. That matches the way that the visualization is done uh, already in Topcat and also in Stilt. So those are uh, user interface layers uh, which talk to a library which is internally called Plot2, which, uh, and the Plot2 library knows about all the different plot types, knows about all the configurations of the plot types, and knows how to generate images. The user interface layer is just tasked with asking the user how to fill in those various configuration options and sending it back to the library. Uh, getting an image back, rendering it, uh, sort of rather displaying it to the user. And then when the user interacts with it, the user interface says to the library, hey, the user's dragged the mouse from here to here. Can you give me a new image? Uh, and given that, it's relatively straightforward to add a new uh, user interface layer, a web application. And so that's what I've done here. Um, I'm eliding things a bit. There's actually a reasonable amount of complication on the UE side to do with uh, especially caching data and so on to make the whole thing run fast, but uh, that's the basic story. Um, and so that's what I've done. We've got uh, uh, plots in the browser which are asking the server for uh, image pixels uh, at every frame. And I won't go through the details of this. You can look at the slides online later if you want to, but the bottom line is it works and it works at typically a few frames per second update because it's having to move the image data from uh, across the network at every frame. That's not kind of uh, super smooth animation of the sort that you'd expect from uh, a gameplay environment, but it's good enough for interactive and explorative data analysis, uh, interactive visualization. In your web page, in your web application, this is what you write uh, to embed one of these plots. And so you just start off by uh, importing a small JavaScript library. It's just a few hundred lines of uh, JavaScript that's supplied with the, uh, with the server library. Um, and then you just write these name equal value pairs which specify the kind of plot that you want to do. If you've used stilts for plotting, you'll recognize the syntax. It's exactly the same, and it's documented in detail in the stilts documentation. So as well as saying what kind of plot that you want to do and uh, configure op configuration options like color maps and, and how you want the shading to work and so on, um, you can do non-trivial specifications of, uh, of, of things to do with the coordinates. So here I've added a selection criterion. It's not plotting all the rows in the input table. Uh, it's using this expression here, and um, the, co the, the coordinates it's plotting are, uh, in this case, an absolute magnitude, which is constructed from two columns in the input data. So you're not restricted to using uh, just, just plotting column three against column four. You can uh, use the expression language, which comes with stilts, to do uh, sophisticated manipulation of the tabular data and really plot anything that's in that table just by changing the specification in the client side. So I'll give a couple of examples. Um, oops, that's not the one. So this is uh, sitting in a browser, and it's a plot which is a HR diagram from Gaia DR2. And uh, I should be able to zoom around. Um, and I can change the size of the plot and so on uh, and, and interact with it in just the same way that I would in Topcat. And if I'm interested in one of these points in particular, I can just click on it and then uh, the JavaScript both goes back to the server and asks the service, OK, what's all the row data concerning this particular point? And it sends it back to the browser and, and the browser can display it. Uh, this is another example which is in three dimensions, and this is in velocity space, small Gaia data of uh, 
data with points with a particular parallax cut. Um, so this is in 3D velocity space, and you can see that uh, I hope um, there's a little over density of points here. So it can work. Uh, this little knot of points is actually the Hyades. These are all objects which are moving through three, through space with the same 3D velocity. Uh, and so I can do something like zoom in on this, see what the bounds of this plot are. They're uh, listed here in UVW space. And then you could imagine using those uh, bounds as criteria for a, a subsequent ADQL search to uh, locate similar objects in, a, in a, another database, for instance. Two minute time. Thank you. Uh, this is a uh, much larger plot. There are 77 million rows in this. Uh, and it's not particularly fast. I should say this isn't running on a fast server. Um, but it's uh, it's possible to zoom in uh, and pan around and so on. Uh, and so there's a few tens of millions of rows uh, and it's, it's usable. Uh, this also works in uh, Jupyter Notebook. So all you need to do is have some uh, code which inserts the uh, relevant HTML into the output cell of the Jupyter Notebook. And what I have here is a plot again of uh, some Gaia data. Um, and this is uh, all, I think there are 7 million points in this plot uh, coded by radial velocity. Um, and again, I can interact with this plot in the, in the output cell of the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, and if I don't want that plot, of course, I can change various uh, things about it and uh, change the shape, change the color map. And rather than code by radial velocity, I'll code by color. So then I've got a different uh, different plot, uh, and that's in rows. And again, it's not running on a fast server. This could be uh, significantly faster if it was on uh, better hardware. Okay, so that's the examples. So how do you go about using this? Um, well, one possibility is if you're a data archive, you could embed some of those plots or possibilities for, for user specified plots in your archive results page um, when you, if the user's made a query and, and gets back some data, as well as the option to download the data, you could give them a, a, a live plot to play around with. If you're a research scientist who's published a paper with some figures in that are static in a journal article, you could imagine setting up a local service which had some figures that people could interact with, they could zoom in and out. Um, you've seen the Jupyter Notebook, that could work in various ways. One way could just be to interact with some data that's already sat on your server and so the whole thing could be local to one machine. Um, but if you're a science platform, then you could imagine setting that up on the service and then the user could sit uh, on a browser on the local machine um, and have interactive plots which are uh, interacting with data which they generated or which is static data on the uh, service without the bulk data ever moving down to the client. In terms of deployment, this is uh, implemented as a servlet, so you can, uh, you can run that within Tomcat or whatever you've got. If that's too much trouble, uh, you can just run a, a one line command using still, still server and it will run up on the local host, which uh, could be public if that port's public. Uh, and there's a Docker image as well, uh, if you like that sort of thing. In terms of resource requirements, uh, the server needs to be access, be able to access the table uh, in some format that, uh, that still can understand. The IO library fits files are a good choice, but other options are available. It ought to be able to talk to a relational database using SQL directly. I haven't tried that, but I think that should work. Uh, it will help if it's got a reasonable size disk cache uh, and fast disks and multiple cores. It will work better. On the client side, the requirements are uh, very limited. You just need a browser, really. So I'd say this is working but experimental. If you download the latest Steep Silts release, you'll have that in there. I haven't tested it under heavy multi-user loads. Uh, there are multiple things which I could imagine doing better than it's done at the moment. I don't plan to work on those directly. Part of the point of doing this talk is to see if there are people out there who would be interested in deploying this sort of thing, and if so, talk to them and find out what their requirements would be. So I'll leave it there. Um, that if you want to have a go at it, there are a couple of running instances uh, on the last two links here. Um, if all the people looking at this seminar uh, go and jump on those links at the moment, it will probably crash those servers. So uh, I can't guarantee you what you're gonna get, but, um, but there are various options for playing around with it. 
So thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Uh, there are a few questions. There's one that I just answered. Stephen is asking if you have 500 million points, what kind of performance can you expect? That depends on what machine you're using, I think. I mean, so that what you're watching there was running on a machine with, uh, I think, 16 cores, but it's an old creaky machine. And actually, those animations work considerably faster on my four core laptop. So if you're, I mean, we, we saw in the Pangeo um, very impressive demonstration earlier on, uh, you know, if you've got a supercomputer, uh, you can come up with, you, you can visualize that sort of thing, that sort of a size data set interactively. Um, I'm using the same sort of approach that Data Shader uses. So I suspect that I would, uh, it would be feasible if you had um, a lot of cores to run that sort of thing. Um, but I don't have one of those machines in my back pocket to test it with. If, if you do, I'd be uh, happy to play around and, and see how it works. Yeah, I saw in your slides there, you have some Docker command lines, how you can run something from you. Um, are the slides already available? It's a little yeah, hard to slides, cut and paste uh, from there. So they're associated with the... Um, with the talk. Uh, with, with the, the talk. So yeah, if you go there, you yep. can see the, the slides. Okay, great. People can just try that out if they want. That's yep. great. Yeah, that, that those commands, yes. All right, um, I think we've exhausted the questions. So thanks again, Mark. Thank you. Oh, wait, wait one more. Can one I, more, since sorry, we, since we uh, I'm in a bizarre position because I cannot write the questions as a, a panelist. Mark, uh, I will also abuse the, my position of being able to turn the mic on. Uh, Mark, have you looked at all at WebAssembly, that kind of stuff? No, I haven't. So, I mean, this is, as I said, it, a kind of thin layer on top of the uh, visualization that Topcat already does. And all the hard work is done by the server side, which is written in Java uh, using code that I've already got. So uh, WebAssembly, which would make the, um, the, uh, the client side work faster, wouldn't do much um, without putting a lot of effort into the client side development. At the moment, the client side, there's very little there. There's just a bit of JavaScript um, that enables it to talk to the service. So that will be a whole different project. Cool, thanks. Yeah, I see actually more questions popped up. One is from Heinz Berndt. Is there any mechanism for user access control or is that supposed to be via access to the server port only? Okay, so that's one of the things uh, that I've got in things I might do if it looks like it's a good idea, improve data access security options. If you run the Docker, um, then you can do the, the control uh, via Docker, so that works fine. There is some uh, somewhat half-baked access control for which table, which, what tables you're allowed to use on the uh, service. So essentially when you construct the plot, you, you configure it and say, uh, I want to look at this table and this is a file name in the file system. And in, when you set up the service, you can say, okay, those file names can only apply to certain directories. Um, but at the moment, that's not really bulletproof. Uh, if people were keen to use it and wanted better access controls, that would be something I'd look at, uh, at improving. All right, and then I'll take one last question since we have a little bit of time. Mathieu is asking, um, and he says, hello, Mark. Did you investigate using the GPU with OpenGL or the new Vulkan API for fast rendering in server side? No, um, because everything I, well, uh, okay. So I might be interested to discuss that more, but everything I'm doing on the server side is in Java, which doesn't require anything funny or complicated. Uh, just J2SE basically, um, in order to make the uh, the installation and runtime requirements straightforward. So those things I suspect um, have complicated runtime dependencies, which I've generally avoided in this, but it might be an interesting uh, thing to discuss. All right, thank you, Mark. Thank you.